Do you want to hear a story? Yeah! yeah. This is uh, brand new, so I don't know if it's any good or not, but it's called, it has a very Stephen King title, it's called Afterlife. William Andrews, an investment banker with Goldman Sachs, dies on the afternoon of September 23rd, 2012. It is an expected death. His wife and adult children are at his bedside. That evening, when she finally allows herself some time alone, away from the steady stream of family and condolence visitors, Lynn Andrews calls her oldest friend who still lives in Milwaukee. It was Sally Freeman who introduced her to Bill, and if anyone deserves to know about the last 60 seconds of their marriage, it's Sally. He was out of it for most of the last week, the drugs, but conscious at the end. His eyes were open and he saw me. He smiled. I took his hand and he squeezed it a little. I bent over and kissed his cheek. When I straightened up again, he was gone. She has been waiting for hours to say this, and with it said, she bursts into tears. Her assumption that the smile was for her is natural enough, but mistaken. As he is looking up at his wife and three gr grown children, they seem impossibly tall, creatures of angelic good health inhabiting a world he is now departing. Bill feels the pain he has lived with for the past 18 months leave his body. It pours out like slop from a bucket, so he smiles. With the pain gone, there's little left. His body feels as light, light as a fluff of milkweed. His wife takes his hand, reaching down from her tall and healthy world. He has reserved a little bit of strength, which he now expends by squeezing her fingers. She bends down. She is going to kiss him. Before her lips can touch his skin, a hole appears in the center of his vision. It's not a black hole, but a white one. It spreads, obliterating the only world he's known since 1956, when he was born in the small Hemingford County Hospital in Nebraska. During the last year, Bill has read a great deal about the passage from life to death. On his computer, always careful to obliterate the history so as not to upset Lynn, who is constantly and unrealistically upbeat. And while most of it struck him as bullshit, the so-called white light phenomenon seemed quite plausible. For one thing, it has been reported in all cultures. For another, it has a smidgen of scientific credibility. One theory he's read suggests the white light comes as a result of the sudden cessation of blood flow to the brain. Another, more elegant, posits that the brain is performing a final global scan in an effort to find an experience comparable to dying, or it may just be a final firework. Whatever the cause, Bill Andrews is now experiencing it. The white light obliterates his family and the airy room from which the mortuary assistants will soon remove his sheeted, breathless body. In his researches, he became familiar with the acronym NDE, standing for Near Death Experience. In many of these experiences, the white light becomes a tunnel, at the end of which stand beckoning family members who have already died, or friends, or angels, or Jesus, or some other beneficent deity. Bill expects no welcoming committee. What he expects is for the final firework to fade to the blackness of oblivion. But that doesn't happen. When the brilliance dims, he's not in heaven or hell. He's in a hallway. He supposes it could be purgatory, a hallway painted industrial green and floored and scuffed in dirty tile could very well serve as purgatory, but only if it went on forever. This one ends 20 feet down at a door with a sign on it reading, Isaac Harris, manager. Bill stands, <laughs> Bill stands where he is for a few moments, inventorying himself. He's wearing the pajamas he died in, at least he assumes he died, and he's barefooted, but there's no sign of the cancer that first tasted his body, then gobbled it, but down to nothing but skin and skeleton. He looks to be back at about 190, which was his fighting weight, slightly soft-bellied, granted, before the cancer struck. 
He feels his buttocks in the small of his back. The bed sores are gone. Nice. He takes a deep breath and exhales without coughing. Even nicer. He walks a little way down the hall. On his left is a fire extinguisher with a peculiar graffito above it. Better late than never. <laughs> On his right is a bulletin board. On this, a number of photographs have been pinned, the old-fashioned kind with decal edges. Above them is a hand-printed banner reading, Company Picnic, 1956. What fun we had. <laughs> Bill examines the photographs, which show executives, secretaries, office personnel, and a gaggle of romping kids. There's a, there are guys tending a barbecue, one wearing the obligatory joke toque, guys and gals tossing horseshoes, guys and gals playing volleyball, guys and gals swimming in a lake. The guys are wearing bathing suits that look almost obscenely short and tight to his 21st century eye but very few are carrying big guts. They have 50s physiques, Bill thinks. The gals are wearing those old-fashioned Esther Williams tank suits, the kind that make women look as if, not as if they have buttocks, but only a kind of cleftless bulge above the backs of their thighs. <laughs> Hot dogs are being consumed. Beer is being drunk. Everyone appears to be having a whale of a good time. In one of the pictures, he sees Richie Blankmore's father handing Anne-Marie Winkler a toasted marshmallow. This is ridiculous because Richie's dad was a truck driver and never went to a company picnic in his life. Anne-Marie was a girl he dated in college. In another photo, he sees Bobby Tisdale, a college classmate from the early 70s. Bobby, who referred to himself as Tiz the Wiz, died of a heart attack while still in his 30s. He was probably on earth in 1956, but would have been in kindergarten or the first grade, not drinking beer on the shore of Lake Whatever. In this picture, the Wiz looks about 20, which would have been his age when Bill knew him. In a third picture, Eddie Scarponi's mom is baffing a volleyball. Eddie was Bill's best friend when the family moved from Nebraska to Paramus, New Jersey, and Gina Scarponi once glimpsed sunning herself on the patio in filmy white panties and nothing else, was one of Bill's favorite fantasies when he was still on his masturbation learner's permit. <laughs> the guy in the joke toke is Ronald Reagan. Bill looks closely, his nose almost pressing against the black and white photo, and there can be no doubt, the 40th president of the United States is flipping burgers at a company picnic. What company, though? Where exactly is he? His euphoria at being whole again and pain-free is fading. What replaces it is a growing sense of dislocation and unease. Seeing these familiar people in photographs doesn't make sense, and the fact that he doesn't know the majority of them offers marginal comfort at best. He looks behind him and sees stairs leading up to another door. Printed on this one in large block red letters is LOCKED. That leaves only Mr. Harris's office. Bill walks down there, hesitates, knocks. It's open! Bill walks in. <laughs> Beside a cluttered desk stands a fellow in baggy, high-waisted suit pants held up by suspenders. His brown hair is plastered to his skull and parted in the middle. He wears rimless glasses. The walls are covered with invoices and corny leg art cheesecake pics that make Bill think of the trucking company Richie Blankmore's dad worked for. He went there a few times with Richie, and the dispatch office looked like this. According to the calendar on one wall, it's March of 1911, which makes no more sense than 1956. To Bill's right as he enters, there's a door. To his left is another. There are no windows, but a glass tube comes out of the ceiling and dangles over a Dan Duck's laundry basket. The basket is filled with a heap of yellow sheets that look like more like invoices, or maybe they're memos. Files are piled two feet high on the chair in front of the desk. Bill Anderson, isn't it? The man goes behind the desk and sits down. There's no offer to shake hands. Andrews, right, and I'm Harris. Here you are again, Andrews. <laughs> Given all Bill's research on dying, this comment actually makes sense. 
and it's a relief. As long as he doesn't have to come back as a dung beetle or something. So, it's reincarnation, is that the deal? Isaac Harris sighs. You always ask the same thing, and I always give the same answer. Not really. <laughs> I'm dead, aren't I? Do you feel dead? No, but I saw the white light. Ah, oh, yes, <laughs> the famous white light. There you were, and here you are. Wait a minute, just hold the phone. Harris breezes through the papers on his desk, doesn't find what he wants, and starts opening drawers. From one of them, he takes a few more folders and selects one. He opens it, flips a page or two, and nods. Just refreshing myself a bit. Investment banker, aren't you? Yes. Wife, three kids, two sons, one daughter? Correct. Apologies, I have hundreds of pilgrims, and it's hard to keep them straight. I keep meaning to put these folders in some sort of order, but that's really a secretarial job, and <laughs> since they've never provided me with one, who is they? No idea. All communications come via the tube. He taps it. The tube sways, then stills. Runs on compressed air. Latest thing. <laughs> Bill picks up the folders on the client's chair and looks at the man behind the desk, eyebrows raised. Just put them on the floor, Harris says. That'll do for now. One of these days, I really am going to get organized. If there are days. Probably are. Nights, too, but who can say for sure? No windows in here, as you will have noticed. Also, no clocks. Bill sits down. Why call me a pilgrim if it's not reincarnation? Harris leans back and laces his hands behind his neck. He looks up at the pneumatic tube, which probably was the latest thing at some time or other, say around 1911, although Bill supposes such things might still have been in use around 1956. Harris shakes his head and chuckles, although not in a, an amused way. If you only knew how wearisome you guys become. <laughs> According to the files, this is our 15th visit. I've never been here in my life, Bill says. He considers this. Except it's not my life, is it? It's my afterlife. Actually, it's mine. You're the pilgrim, not me. You and the other bozos who parade in and out of here. You'll use one of the doors and go. I stay. There's no bathroom here because I no longer have to perform toilet functions. There's no bedroom because I no longer have to sleep. All I do is sit around and visit with you traveling bozos. You come in, you ask the same questions, and I give the same answers. That's my afterlife. Sound exciting? <laughs> Bill, who has encountered all the theological ins and outs during his final research project, decides he had the right idea while he was still in the hall. You're talking about purgatory. Oh, no doubt. The only question I have is how long I'll be staying. I'd like to tell you I'll eventually go mad if I can't move on, but I don't think I can do that any more than I can take a shit or a nap. I know my name means nothing to you, but we've discussed this before. Not every time you show up, but on several occasions. He waves an arm with enough force to cause some of the invoices tacked on the wall to flutter. This is, or was, I'm not sure which is actually correct. My earthly office in 1911, just so. I'd ask you if you know what a shirt waist is, Bill, but since I know you don't, I'll tell you. A woman's blouse. At the turn of the century, I and my partner, Max Blank, owned a business called the Triangle Shirtwaist Company. Mm. Profitable business, but the women who worked there were a large pain in the hinder end always sneaking out to smoke, and, this was worse, stealing stuff, which they would put in their purses or tuck up under their skirts. So, we locked the doors to keep them in during their shifts and searched them on their way out. Long story short, the damn place caught on fire one day. Max and I escaped by going up to the roof and down the fire escape. Many of the women were not so lucky. Although, let's be honest and admit, there was a lot of blame to go around. Smoking was strictly verboten, but plenty of them did it anyway, and it was a cigarette that started the blaze. Fire Marshal said so. Max and I were tried for manslaughter, 
and acquitted. Bill recalls the fire extinguisher in the hall with better late than never printed above it. He thinks you were found guilty in the retrial, Mr. Harris, or you wouldn't be here. How many women died? 146, Harris says, and I regret every one, Mr. Anderson. Bill doesn't bother correcting him on the name. 20 minutes ago, he was dying in his bed. Now he is fascinated by this old story, which he has never heard before, that he remembers anyway. Not long after Max and I got down the fire escape, the women crammed onto it. The damn thing couldn't take the weight. It collapsed and spilled two dozen of them 100 feet to the cobblestones. They all died. 40 more jumped from the ninth and 10th floor windows. Some were on fire. They all died too. The fire brigade got there with life nets, but the women tore right through them and exploded on the pavement like bags filled with blood. A terrible sight, Mr. Anderson, terrible. Others jumped down the elevator shafts, but most just burned. Like 9-11 with fewer casualties. So you always say, and you're here. Yes, indeedy. I sometimes wonder how many men are sitting in offices just like this. Women, too. I'm sure there are women. I've always been forward-looking and see no reason why women can't fill low-level executive positions, and admirably. All of us answering the same questions and sending on the same pilgrims. You'd think that the load would lighten a little each time one of you decides to use the right-hand door instead of that one, he points to the left. But no, no. A fresh canister comes down the tube, zoop, and I get two new bozos to replace the one old one, sometimes three. He leans forward and speaks with great emphasis. This is a shitty job, Mr. Anderson. <laughs> it's Andrews, Bill says, and look, I'm sorry you feel that way, but Jesus, take a little responsibility for your actions, man. 146 women, and you did lock the doors. Harris hammers his desk. They were stealing us blind. He picks up the folder and shakes it at Bill. You should talk. Ha! Pot calling the kettle black. Goldman Sachs. Security fraud. Profits in the billions. Taxes in the millions. The low millions. Does the phrase housing bubble ring a bell? How many clients' trust did you abuse? How many people lost their life savings thanks to your greed and short-sightedness? Uh, Bill knows what Harris is talking about, but all that chicanery, well, most of it, went on far above his pay grade. He was as surprised as anyone when the excrement hit the cooling device. The proof of his essential innocence, it seems to him, is that he is the pilgrim and Harris is stuck in this office. He's tempted to say there's a big difference between being beggared and burned alive, but why rub salt into the wound? Let's drop it, he says. If you have information I need, why not give it to me? Fill me in on the deal, and I'll get out of your hair. I wasn't the one smoking, Harris says in a low and brooding tone. I wasn't the one dropped the match. Mr. Harris, Bill can feel the walls closing in. If I had to be here forever, I'd shoot myself, he thinks. Only, if what Mr. Harris is saying is true, he wouldn't want to any more than he would want to go to the toilet. Okay, all right. Harris makes a lip-flapping sound, not quite a raspberry. <sighs> the deal is this. Leave through the left door, and you get to live your life over again. A to Z, start to finish. Take the right one, and you wink out. Poof, candle in the wind type of thing. At first, Bill says nothing to this. He's incapable of speech and not sure he can trust his ears. It's too good to be true. His mind turns to his brother Mike and the accident that happened when Mike was eight, next to the stupid shoplifting thing when Bill was 17. Just a lark, but it could have put a hole in his college plans if his father hadn't stepped in and talked to the right person. The thing with Anne Marie in the fraternity house, that still haunts him at odd moments, even after all these years. And of course, the big one, Harris is smiling, and the smile isn't a bit pleasant. Okay, so his ears did deceive him. Or maybe Harris was just getting back at him for suggesting that Harris deserved to be here in this limbo of bureaucracy. 
I know what you're thinking because I've heard it all from you before about how you and your brother were playing flashlight tag where you were, when you were kids and you slammed the bedroom door to keep him out and accidentally cut off the tip of his pinky finger. The impulse shoplifting thing, the watch, and how your dad pulls strings to get you out of it. That's right, no record, except with him. He never let me forget it. And then there's the girl in the frat house. Harris lifts the file. Her name's in here somewhere, I imagine. I do my best to keep the files current when I can find them. But why don't you refresh me? Anne-Marie Winkler. Bill can feel his cheeks heating up. It wasn't date rape, so don't get that idea. She put her legs around me when I got on top of her, and if that doesn't say consent, I don't know what does. Did she uh, also put her legs around the two fellows who came next? No, Bill was tempted to say, but at least we didn't light her on fire, smartass. But still, he'd be teeing off on the 7th or working in his wood shop or talking to his daughter, now a college student herself, about her senior thesis, and he would wonder where Anne Marie is now, what she's doing, what she remembers about that night. Harris's job widens to a locker room smirk. It may be a shitty job, but it's clear. There are parts of it he enjoys. I can see that's a question you don't want to answer, so why don't we move along? You're thinking of all the things you'll change during your next ride on the cosmic carousel. This time you won't slam the door on your kid brother's finger or try to shoplift a watch at the Paramus Mall. It was the Mall of New Jersey. I'm sure it's in your file somewhere. <laughs> Harris gives Bill a, Bill's folder a getaway fly flap and continues. Next time, you'll decline to fuck your semi-comatose date as she lies on the sofa in the basement of your fraternity house. And, big one, you'll actually make that appointment for the colonoscopy instead of putting it off, having now decided, correct me if you're wrong, that the indignity of having a camera shoved up your ass is better than dying of colon cancer. Bill says, several times I've come close to telling Lynn about that frat house thing. I've never had the courage. But given the chance, you'd fix it. Of course, given the chance, wouldn't you unlock those factory doors? Indeed I would, but there are no second chances. Sorry to disappoint you. He doesn't look sorry. Harris looks tired. Harris looks bored. Harris also looks meanly triumphant. He points to the door on Bill's left. Use that one as you have on every other occasion and you begin all over again as a five-pound baby boy sliding from your mother's womb into the doctor's hands. You'll be taken home, wrapped in bunting, to a farm in central Nebraska. When your father sells the farm in 1964, you'll move to New Jersey. There, you will cut off the tip of your brother's little finger while playing tag. You'll go to the same high school, you'll take the same courses, you'll make exactly the same grades, you'll go to Boston College, and you'll commit the same act of semi-rape in the same fraternity house basement. You'll watch as the same two fraternity brothers then have sex with Anne Marie Winkler, and although you'll think you should call a halt to what's going on, you'll never quite muster up the moral, the moral fortitude to do so. Three years later, you'll meet Linda Salvo, and two years after that, you'll be married. You'll follow the same career path, you'll have the same friends, you'll have the same deep disquiet about some of your firm's business practices, and you'll keep the same silence. The same doctor will urge you to get a colonoscopy when you turn 50, and you will promise, as you always do, that you'll take care of that little matter. You won't, and as a result, you'll die of the same cancer. Harris's smile as he drops the folder back on his cluttered desk is now so wide it almost creases the lobes of his ears. Then you'll come here and we'll have the same discussion. My advice would be to use the other door and have done with it, but of course, that is your decision. Bill has listened to this sermonette with increasing dismay. I'll remember nothing, nothing, not quite nothing, Harris says. You may have noticed some photos in the hall the company picnic. Yes, every client who visits me sees pictures from the year of his or her birth and recognizes a few familiar faces among all the strange ones. 
When you live your life over again, Mr. Anders, presuming you decide to, you will have a sense of deja vu when you first see these people, a sense that you have lived it all before, which of course you have. You will have a fleeting sense, almost a surety, that there is more, shall we say, more depth to your life and to existence in general than you previously believed. But then it will pass. If it's all the same, with no possibility of improvement, why are we even here? Harris makes the fists and knocks with the end, on the end of the pneumatic tube, hanging above the laundry basket, making it swing. Client wants to know why we're here, wants to know what it's all about, Alfie. <laughs> he waits. Nothing happens. He folds his hand on his desk. When Job wanted to know that, Mr. Anders, God asked if Job was there when he, God, made the universe. I guess you don't even rate that much of a reply. So, let's consider the matter closed. What do you want to do? Pick a door. Bill is thinking about the cancer, the pain of the cancer. To go through all that again, except he wouldn't remember he'd gone through it already. There's that assuming Isaac Harris is telling the truth. No memories at all? No changes at all? Are you sure? How can you be? Because it's always the same conversation, Mr. Anderson. Each time, and with all of you. It's Andrews! He bellows it, surprising both of them. In a lower voice, he says, if I try, if I really, really try, I'm sure I can hold on to something, even if it's only what happened to Mike's little finger. And one change might be enough to, I don't know, to take Anne Marie to a movie instead of to that fucking kegger. How about that? Harris says, there's a folk tale that before birth, every human soul knows all the secrets of life and death in the universe. But then, just before birth, an angel leans down and puts his fingers to the new baby's lips and whispers, shh. Harris touches his philtrum. According to the story, this is the mark left by the angel's finger. Every human being has one. Have you ever seen an angel, Mr. Harris? No, but I once saw a camel. It was in the Bronx Zoo. <laughs> Choose a door. As he considers, <laughs> as he considers, Bill remembers a story they had read in junior high, The Lady or the Tiger. This decision is nowhere near as difficult. I must hold on to just one thing, he tells himself, as he opens the door that leads back into life. Just one thing. Then the white light envelops him. The doctor who will bolt the Republican Party and vote for Adlai Stevenson in the fall, something his wife must never know, bends forward from the waist like a waiter presenting a tray and comes up holding a naked baby by the heels. He gives it a sharp smack and the squalling begins. You have a healthy baby boy, Mrs. Andrews, he says. Congratulations. She takes the baby. She kisses his damp cheeks and brow. They will name him William after her paternal grandfather. When the 21st century comes, he'll still be in his 40s. The idea is dizzying. In her arms, she holds not just a new life, but a universe of possibilities. Nothing, she thinks, could be more wonderful. Thanks. Oh. Yeah! <laughs> Thanks. Woo. Thank you. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, God, that's great. Thank you. All right. Okay, I will read it again. <laughs> great, man. Beautiful. Thanks. We're going to take some questions, yeah? Yes. You got some time. Thank you.